Good morning, dear students. Uh, my name is Farhan Mazar, and today is uh, 22nd of the March 2021. And today we are studying the subject Physics 5054, O-Levels Physics. And uh, we are today going to attempt uh, uh, MC2 paper. We call it paper one. <clears throat> today we are going to solve October, November 2020 paper uh, one one. This is a paper from the zone one. Let's start this paper. Okay. So a little tricky question in your on your screen. Uh, I have to reduce the size. So let's first of all read the first portion. A heavy nail is fixed firmly to a wall. It is pulled by a string at forty degree to the vertical. The nail does not move. Three forces act on the nail. Its weight, W, the tension, T, in the string. The force, R, exerted by the wall. Which diagram drawn to scale represents the three forces? You see this whole system is in equilibrium. The nail is not moving, so it means the sum of the three forces should be zero. So uh, you see the weight here should be acting downward. This uh, the tension in the string, which is making 90 degree angle with the vertical, and this tension in the string, the weight and the reaction, the force exerted by the ball. These three forces, they should cancel out each other. Their sum should be zero. So uh, he says, which diagram represents? Let me. Reduce the size so you can all. So the diagram will be, that diagram will be correct in which there will be three forces shown and they are being, they are using the head to tail rule and their sum is zero. You see, if the three forces are added and how in the head to tail rule you will show that their resultant is zero. If you take the first vector, on its head, you put the tail of the second vector. On the head of the second vector, you put the tail of the third vector. And the head of the third vector should join the tail of the first vector. If this is how the vectors are represented, then their resultant will be zero. When they will be added up, the resultant will be zero because the head of the last vector if it joins the tail of the first vector, then it means that the resultant is zero. So you see, uh, the, if you look at the first diagram, here he has shown the tension. Uh, so suppose this is the first uh, vector. On the head of the first vector, he has put the tail of the second vector, weight, which is acting downward. And on the head of the uh, second vector, he has put the tail of the third vector, which is the, the force exerted by the wall. And you can see the head of the last vector, which is the R force. It is joining the tail of the first vector, which means that this first figure uh, is correctly obeying the head to tail rule. And the resultant of these two, these three forces will be zero. So most probably A should be the answer. Let me check from the marking scheme. So you can see A is the answer. Yeah, A is the answer. Now, I have done this on a paper also. Let me show you my work. And uh, here we go. We are solving October, November 2020, Physics 5054. And this is the first paper. Okay, so question number one, you see here I have tried to find out, for example, if this is the weight. And for example, I represented the weight here. And here on the head of this weight, I have uh, put the tension. The tension making 40 degree angle with the vertical. So I'm using the triangular law. The resultant should be, uh, the result of weight and the tension should be this. Okay. Join the tail of the first vector with the head of the last vector. That should be the resultant. Now, the three forces to balance, you know, three forces to balance. 
that r should be equals to uh, this length but its direction should be opposite to this resultant to balance these two forces this this is the result of these two this is the sum of these two the r force must be in the same way it should have the same length but the arrows should be in this way so the a diagram which is for a resultant to be zero the a diagram is a perfect diagram which where they have shown tension then the weight and this is the r this r is in opposite direction to the resultant of w and t so you can understand this in this way also so you can see that these three forces adding up by triangular law or you can say uh, head to tail rule and because the tail of the first is joined with the head of the last so the result of these these three forces will be zero so i hope that i have tried to explain this concept by two different methods so i hope that you have understood it so let's move to the next question the next question is question number 2 okay a car begins to move it speeds up until it reaches a constant speed it continues to travel at this constant speed for the rest of the journey what happens to the acceleration and what happens to the velocity of the car during the journey you see this try to understand the story he says a car begins to move so it was at rest and then it begins to move it speeds up so the speed is changing so it means it's accelerating and up until it reaches a constant speed. then the speed become constant when the speed will become constant the acceleration will become zero so it means that the the speed or the velocity of the car is changing and at the start there was some acceleration and at the end when the car started moving with a constant speed the acceleration has become zero so his question is what happens to the acceleration and what happens to the velocity of the car during the journey they both were changing both the acceleration and the velocity uh, change so that's true so this is a part i think that's the answer only the acceleration change that's not true the velocity was also changing the speed was changing only the velocity changes that's wrong neither the acceleration nor the velocity change that's totally wrong so question number 2 a is the choice okay next move question number 3 a car of mass 800 kg has a forward acceleration of 2.5 meter per second square a frictional force of 1200 newton opposes the motion of the car what is the driving force due to the engine of the car you see the driving force has to provide the force for the acceleration plus it has to provide the force to overcome the friction so the force which is required to produce this much acceleration we can find out that force with the help of newton's second law of motion that says f is equals to m a so if i want to find out that force f is equals to m a is the formula m is 800 kg and the a value is 2.5 meter per second square just put these values in that formula and you can find the force which is required so let me show you i have done this on a paper let me show you so f is equals to m a f is equals to 800 multiplied 2.5 so that give you 2000 newton so the driving force should be this the driving force should provide force for this force for the acceleration plus to overcome the friction so that will be 2000 newton plus 1200 newton and it will be 3200 newton so the driving force must be 3200 newton so let's check what is the answer 3200 newton so question number 3 d is the choice question number 3 d is the right choice question number 4 a parachutist falling at a steady speed opens her parachute the so the parachutist is already at steady speed but then he opens his parachute so before opening his parachute he is moving with a steady speed it means the weight and the air resistance before opening the parachute they are equal to each other the air resistance is equals to the weight of the parachutist before opening the parachute 
which row is correct for the direction of the resultant force and for the direction of the acceleration of the parachutist just after her parachute opens. So you see, before opening the parachute, he says uh, the parachutist is falling at a steady speed. Uh, at a steady speed, opens her parachute. It means he was already at a steady speed. So his weight and the acceleration, uh, his weight and the air resistance, they were equal to each other. The resultant force was zero. So what happened? He opened his parachute. So when he will open his parachute, what will happen? His surface area will become very large. The air resistance he will be experiencing when once the parachute opens, the air resistance will he will experience will be more than his weight. So there will be a resultant force in the upward direction. The man is falling downward, but because the air resistance will be larger than his weight when he will open the parachute. So what will happen? The resultant force will be in the upward direction. He is falling downward. The resultant force will be in the upward direction because air resistance will be more than his weight. So uh, now the resultant force is in the upward direction, but he is falling downward. If the resultant force is opposite to the direction of the motion, uh, it will call it will cause deceleration, and the direction of the deceleration, or the, we also call it acceleration, but this will be opposite to your motion. So the man is falling downward. The resultant force will be in the upward direction, and the acceleration will be also in the upward direction. So I think the resultant force direction should be upward, and the and the acceleration should also be in the upward direction. So D is the right answer. D is the right answer. Okay, next question on your screen is, uh, oh my, I just, by mistake, I just, I like it there, okay. Some gas trapped in a cylinder is compressed at constant temperature by a piston. The important thing is that some gas trapped in a cylinder is compressed at constant temperature. So the temperature is constant by a piston, which property of gas does not change. You see, uh, the temperature is constant and it's they are trying to compress it. So they are decreasing its volume. Which property of the gas does not change? They are decreasing the volume of the gas. Which property of the gas does not change? Density, that will definitely change because the volume is decreasing. Mass, yes. The mass cannot be changed. So B looks the right answer. We see pressure, pressure will definitely change. B, D, volume, that will also change. It means that the right answer is B. Question number five, B is the right answer. When you compress it, you cannot change its mass. By compressing, you cannot change the mass. Okay, so we are moving to the next question. Next question is on your screen. It says, uh, let me reduce the size. Okay. <clears throat> a block is hung on a spring balance. The marker inside the balance is pulled down by the block. What can the position of the marker be used to determine? You see, uh, this Newton meter, he has shown a Newton meter. The Newton meter basically is used to find out the amount of force applied. And the force is measured in uh, Newtons. So this Newton meter can be used to find out the weight. But the unit will be Newton. So the Newton meter can be used to find out the weight and the unit of the weight should be Newton. The Newton meters are also calibrated. And they can uh, also measure mass, but we have to calibrate them. So the Newton meters can also be used to find out the mass and the unit of the mass should be kg. His question is, what can the position of the marker be used to determine the mass of the block in kg? That is right. That's perfect answer. The mass of the, that's right answer. The B is the mass of the block in Newton. You see, the mass is not measured in Newton. That's a wrong unit. The moment caused by the block in Newton, the Newton meter is not used to measure the moment, and the unit of the moment is not Newton. So C cannot be the answer. The weight of the block in kg. 
yes it can be used to measure the weight but the unit of the weight is not kg so d is also not the answer so a is the right answer question number 6 a is the right answer so uh, we move to the next question and the next question is question number 7 on your screen an electrically charged plastic ball is at rest electrically charged plastic ball is at rest which type of field are caused by the ball so it's a plastic ball so it will have a gravitational field around it and plus it's it's, it's electrically charged so it will have electric field around it but because it's not moving it's charged and it's not moving so it do not have a magnetic field around it if it has been moving then there would be a magnetic field also around it because when the charged particles they move they have a magnetic field around them so this question is which type of field are caused by the ball so electric yes gravitational yes and magnetic no a cannot be the answer electric and gravitational only yeah that is the answer so i think b is the right answer electric and magnetic only magnetic cannot be there gravitational and magnetic only magnetic cannot be there so b is the right answer for question number 7 b is the right answer question number 8 <clears throat> which statement about mass and weight is correct mass is a scientific term that means the same as the weight that's wrong the mass of an object on earth is 10 times its weight that's wrong the formula is w equals to mg where g value is 10 normally so the weight is 10 times the mass if the mass is in kg weight is a scalar quantity which is wrong that's a wrong statement mass is a vector quantity that's wrong so d option is weight is the force of gravity pulling on a mass that's right weight is a force of gravity pulling on a mass so i think d is the right answer question number 8 d is the right answer i hope you have understood which expression is used to calculate density you know very famous uh, equation density is equals to mass divided by volume mass divided by volume so i think p is the right answer p is the right answer i think question number 9 b is the right answer Question number ten: A length of thread is attached to a lamina at the point P, as shown in the diagram. The lamina is free to rotate about the point Q. The tension in the thread is F. What is the moment of the F about the Q? You see, try to understand this. So this is that thread, and the force is acting along this line. so this is basically the line of action of the force this is the line of action of the force and the pivot is at q the pivot is at q and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot is y the moment is the product of the force and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot so the moment of f about q should be f multiply y so i think c is the right answer c is the right answer question number 10 c is the right answer okay on your screen a question number uh question number 11 is showing on your screen which list contains only quantities that can be changed by a force you see when you apply force you can change the shape of the body by applying force you can change the volume of the body 
by applying force you can change the velocity of our body by applying force you can change the density of our body one thing which you cannot change is the mass so we are looking for that list which contains those quantities which can be changed by a force so the a option b option c option cannot be answered the reason is they all have mass in them mass is a quantity which cannot be changed by applying force so i think the d is the right answer can be changed we are looking for the quantities that can be changed by a force so shape yes velocity yes volume yes these all the quantities can be changed by applying applying force so let's move to the next question so d is the option for question number 11 d is the right option question number 11 d is the right option sir so here we have question number 12 question number 12 is on your screen it says uh, an extension load graph is plotted for a spring which point marks the limit of proportionality for this spring the limit of pro proportionality is that point on the extension load graph up till which point the extension load graph is a straight line so after that point what happens the extension load graph starts curving it is no more a straight line its gradient is no more constant so i think b after the point b after this point b the graph started curving so i think the b is the limit of proportionality so b is the right answer question number 12 b is the right answer Question number 13, a mercury manometer is used to measure the pressure of a gas. The pressure of the atmosphere is P0 and the density of the mercury is rho. What is the pressure of the gas? You, can, you see, try to understand this diagram. Here we have gas cylinder and here we have the air, the atmosphere. And you can see that the level of the mercury in both the limbs look at that carefully uh, the limb which is on the gas side the level of the mercury is higher here and the level of the mercury in the side of the manometer which is towards the atmosphere or towards the air here the level of the mercury is lower so the difference between both the levels is h one very simple thing from this diagram you can understand is because the mercury level is higher in on the ga gas side it means that the air pressure is more than the pressure of the gas in the cylinder so it means that the pressure of the air is more than the pressure of the gas so it means gas pressure is less than the atmosphere pressure so the pressure of the gas is less than the pressure of the atmosphere or pressure of the air and but how much it is less than so i can uh, say the, from the atmospheric pressure minus the pressure of this height of the mercury for this height of the mercury the pressure can be calculated as rho g h or h rho g so p naught minus h rho g that is the right answer the pressure of the gas is less than the pressure of the atmosphere and how much less than uh, h height of the mercury so if, when you convert h height of the mercury into the pascal that will you will use the formula h rho g so a is the right answer question number 13 a is the right answer So question of 14, there is a current in a resistor, which energy transfer takes place? In a resistor, the electric energy is converted into heat. So I can say that uh, the electric energy is converted into internal energy because the resistor will become hot. So I think B is the best answer. B is the best answer. Question number 14, B is the best answer. Okay. 
a ball is dropped from a height as shown, ignoring the effect of air resistance, which statement about the total energy of the ball is correct. You see, when you drop this ball and there is no air resistance, the total energy of this system will remain constant. Whether you check it on the point one, whether you check it on the point two, or whether you check it on the point three, no matter where you check it, the total energy of this system will remain constant because there is no air resistance. So there will be no wastage of energy. So whatever is the energy, the total energy at the point one, the total energy at the point two will be the same. And the total energy at the point three will be also same. So ignoring the effect of the air resistance, which statement about the total energy of the ball is correct, it is the same at all, all points. So to me, A is the A is the right answer. You see, A is the right answer. The rest of the answers, they are wrong. So question number 15, A is the right answer. Now we have question number 16 on the screen. Let me reduce the style a little bit. Which source of electric energy is not renewable? Which source of electrical energy is not renewable? Solar cells, that's renewable. Hydroelectric generators, they are renewable. Wind turbines, they are renewable. Yeah, the nuclear reactors. The nuclear reactors are not renewable. Nuclear reactors are not renewable. It's a fact. So question number 16, B is the right answer. Question number 16, D is the right answer. So, <clears throat> question 17, the table shows some data from a high jump competition. Which athlete jumps the highest? So weight here is given and the increase in the gravitational potential energy is also given. So we know that the gravitational potential energy is weight multiply height. So if the weight is known and the gravitational potential energy is known, we can find out the height. So height will be equals to weight divided by weight. Sorry, the, the height will be equals to the gravitational potential energy divided by the weight. So what you will do for all these four options, you will divide the gravitational potential energy with the weight and you will be able to find out the height. So we are looking for the highest jump. So I have done this on a paper, let me show you. So on your screen, you can see the potential energy is given by the formula weight into height. So the first for the first option, I will find out the height is equal to the potential energy divided by weight. Uh, 1320 divided by 600, that will give you 2.2. Height for the second option, 1610 divided by 700, and it gives you a height of 2.3. And the third part is the C option, 1760 divided by 800, that gives you a height of 2.2. And the D part, 1800 divided by 900, and that gives you a height of 2. So the highest height is the second, the B option, 2.3, 2.3. Question number 17, B is the right answer. Let me check. B is the right option, sir. This one is the right option. So for question number 17, B is the right option.
a workman rolls a barrel of weight 2000 newton up a plank of length 2 meter and onto a lorry the back of the lorry is 0 0.80 meter above the horizontal surface of the road what is the work done on the barrel against gravity so you see i know the weight of the barrel and I know the length of the plank, and I know the total vertical height gained during this motion. So work then can be calculated very easily by calculating the change in the gravitational potential energy. So the work done will be equals to the gain in the potential energy. Gain in the gravitational potential energy is weight multiply height. The weight is given 2000 Newton and the height, the vertical height, I mean, that is 0 0.80. So the work done will be equals to weight multiply height. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you. Work done is equals to the gain in the potential energy. Potential energy is MGH or you can say weight into height. So 2000 multiply 0 0.80. And the answer will be 1600 joules. Question number 18. 1600 joules is the answer. In options, it is the B option. Let me show you the... Uh, so this is the option, 1600 joules. I hope you have understood this. Data for three types of electricity generators are shown. So for oil, um, the input energy is given in megajoules and the wasted energy is also given. And for nuclear, the input energy is given 200 and the wasted energy is 160. And hydroelectric, the input energy is 10 and the wasted energy is 1. The question is, which, which is the least efficient generator and which is the most efficient? To find, if you want to find out which one is the least uh, efficient and which one is the most efficient, we need to calculate the efficiency. Efficiency, the formula for the efficiency is uh, useful output energy divided by input energy multiply 100. We know the input energy, we know the wasted energy, so we can find the useful output energy. That will be input energy minus wasted energy. So then I will apply the formula of the efficiency. That is the useful output energy divided by the input energy multiply 1. I have done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. You see. So there are three options given in the first option. 500 is the input, the wasted energy is 300 megajoules. And so you will subtract them and you will divide with the input and multiply with the 100. So for, for, the, for the first portion, uh, you get the 40%. And for the second portion, you get 20%. And for the third portion, you get 90%. So it means that 40, 20, and 90. Let me go back. So this one is 40, 20, and 90. So the nuclear, uh, the most efficient is the hydroelectric. The So most efficient is the hydroelectric. And the least efficient will be, let me check again. The least efficient is the middle one. So the least efficient will be the nuclear. So the nuclear will be the least efficient and the hydroelectric will be the most efficient. So I think question number 19, C is the best option. Question number 19, C is the best option. An instruction in a physics book states, divide the length between two marks 
on the glass tube into 100 equal parts. What is being described? You see, this sentence you will find when we are calibrating a thermometer. So we have on the thermometer, we have the steam point and we have the ice point. And whatever is the distance between the steam point and the ice point on the thermometer, what we do, we divide that distance into 100 equal parts. So this is how you calibrate the thermometer for the degree Celsius. So what is being described? This is probably thermometer. How to calculate weight using the extension of a spring? No. How to calibrate a thermometer? Yes, 100% yes. How to determine uh, pressure with a manometer? No. How to measure volume with a measuring cylinder? No. So B looks the best option. How to calibrate a thermometer? So B is the best answer. Question number 20, B is the right option. So next question on your screen, he says, what is a unit of heat capacity? What is a unit of heat capacity? Heat capacity is heat divided by change in temperature. If you remember, the formula for the heat capacity is energy divided by the change in temperature. So the unit should be joules divided by degree centigrade. So the unit should be joules or joules divided by degree centigrade. So question number 21, C looks the right option, sir. And for question number 21, C is the right option. Next question on your screen, he says, uh, a block of aluminum is heated. A block of aluminum is heated. What happens to the kinetic energy and to the potential energy of the molecules. So you see, when you heat a solid, a block of aluminum, the, when you provide the heat, the kinetic energy of its particles should increase, and the potential energy of its particles should also increase. So I think question number 22A should be the answer. Whenever you heat an object, its kinetic energy of its particles increases, plus the potential energy of its particles also increases when you heat an object. It's a very simple thing. Question number 22, A is the right answer. Which statement about the melting of ice and the boiling of water is correct? Which statement about the melting of ice and the boiling of water is correct? So both these processes involve state change. When these processes are happening, the temperature do not change. Both processes are accompanied by a decrease in volume. No, that's not right. Both processes involve energy transfer and a temperature change. No. There is no temperature change during these processes. Both processes involve the absorption of latent heat. Yes, whenever a state change is happening, the heat absorbed is known as the latent heat. Both processes result in the increase of intermolecular forces that are strong. Both these processes, actually, the intermolecular forces become weaker and weaker. So I think C is the right answer. For question number 23, C is the right answer, sir. Question number 24 is on your screen. A substance has a melting point of minus 17 degrees centigrade. So below minus 17, like minus 18, minus 20, the thing will be solid and above this minus 17 degree. For example, minus 16, minus 15, minus 10, minus 2. 
it will be a liquid and the boiling point of 117 so up to the point of one, uh, temperature of 117 the thing will remain liquid but after 117 or at the 117 the thing will start converting into gas in which state does the substance exist at minus 10 degree centigrade and 110 degree centigrade let me show you my work i have done this on a paper so you can understand it more uh, you can understand it easily and in a better way you see here i have tried to show a number line which is basically showing temperatures and at minus 17 degree centigrade is the melting point so below this temperature the thing will be solid and above this temperature the the substance will be a liquid and 117 degree centigrade that is the boiling point so if the temperature will be more than this that the liquid will convert into gas if the temperature is below this temperature the thing will be a liquid the two temperatures at he is inquiring us about the state of that substance is minus 10 degree centigrade and 110 degree centigrade and when i draw them on this number line you can clearly see that 110 degree centigrade and minus 10 degree centigrade both they are in this 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 area where the substance should be in the form of liquid so at minus 10 degree centigrade that the object will be in the liquid form because minus 10 degree centigrade is higher temperature as compared to the melting point of that substance and at 110 degree centigrade the substance will be liquid because this temperature is less than uh, its boiling point so at minus 10 degree centigrade the substance will be in the form of liquid and at 110 degree centigrade the substance will be in the form of liquid so uh, in both the uh, temperatures it will be in the liquid form so i think c is the right answer question number 24 yeah question number 24 c is the right answer <clears throat> A smoke particle, Z, is seen to move randomly when suspended in air as illustrated. So it's showing a zigzag motion. Which statement explains why the Z moves random? You see, this uh, smoke particle is showing random motion. The reason is it's being bombarded from all directions by the air molecules. So when the air molecules, because the air molecules are moving randomly, so when they collide with this smoke particle, so they make this smoke particle move in this Brownian motion, random motion. So which statement explains why the Z moves randomly? A, air molecules are much larger than Z, no. Air molecules are smaller than Z, no. Air molecules hit the Z from different directions. Yes, this is the reason that why the Z is performing this type of motion in a zigzag irregular motion and Brownian motion. You can see that. So you can see that. So air molecules hit the Z from different directions. So that's why the Z is performing this type of motion. So I think uh, C looks the best option to me. Question number 25, C is the best option, sir. Question number 25, C is the right option. So let's move to the next question. The next question on your screen is, it says, hmm. An electromagnetic wave has a speed of 3 expo 8 meter per second and a wavelength of 10 centimeter. What is the frequency of the wave? We have the famous formula V equals to F lambda. 
V equals to F lambda, where V is the speed of the wave and uh, F is the frequency and lambda is the wavelength. Because the speed is in meter per second, the wavelength also should be in meters. So I can convert the 10 centimeter thing into meter by dividing it with 100. 10 divided by 100 and the answer will be in meters. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. So here we go. So question number 26, V equals to 3x for 8 meter per second, lambda is 10 centimeter, convert it into meter, how? Divide it with 100, so you will get 0 0.1 meter. Apply the formula V is equals to F lambda, F will be equals to V divided by lambda, 3x for 8 divided by 0 0.1, do this on the calculator and your calculator will tell you the answer, 3x for 9 hertz. 3x for 9 hertz. 3x for 9 hertz. And it means 3x for 9 hertz. So D looks the best option, sir. Question number 6. D is the right answer. The next question. Three objects, P, Q, and R, are placed in front of a plane mirror. So here I have a plane mirror. This is a plane mirror. Here are three objects, P, Q, and R. Here is the observer. The student's eye is positioned as shown. So this is the student's eye. Which of the images of the P, Q, and R can the student see in the mirror? So you see how I have decided. Let me show you on my paperwork. I have done this paperwork. And let me show you. So. Here I have, I have tried to recreate that diagram. You see, and I have actually traced that diagram. So the length dimensions are the same. So here is that mirror, the blue color mirror. Here are the objects P, Q, and R. The observer eye is here. So very simple method. So how to draw these diagrams? You see, look at this black color line. Uh, whatever is its distance of the P from the from the mirror, same distance I will take behind the mirror and in the same line. That point I will join with the I. So when it crosses the mirror, I will join that with the P. So you can see this P uh, is being reflected from the mirror. So it means that the I will be able to see the image of the P. Now for the Q, I will do the same thing again. Whatever is the distance of the Q in front of the mirror, on the same line, I will take the same distance. Whatever is the distance of the object in front of the mirror, same will be the distance of the image behind the mirror. So the Q prime will be here. So I will join this point with the observer's eye. And when this line cuts the mirror, I will join this with the Q. So basically this red light will come here and it will be reflected because it's reflecting from the sur surface of the mirror. So it means that the eye will be able to see the, the image of the Q. Now let's decide about R. So whatever is the distance of the R from the mirror, I will take the same distance behind the mirror in the same line. Wherever you get the R prime, you join it with the I. So from R, I will draw a line till here, but you can see that this line, this point is not on the mirror. So this means that the eye or the observer, observer will, it, he will be not able to see the image of R. The observer will be able to see the image of P, the observer, observer will be able to see the image of Q, but he will not be able to see the image of R. The reason is that the light which is reflected and can go into the eye, it is not reflecting from the mirror. 
so mirror is not uh, that long so that's why he will not be able to see the the image of r so so the observer will be able to see the p the observer will observer will be able to see the q but he will not he will be not able to see the r so i think b looks the best option b question number 27 b is the right option sir a ray of light r is incident on a water to air surface with an angle of incidence phi the angle phi or theta is less than the critical angle c which statement describe the subsequent path of the r i have taken this i have drawn this on a paper let me show you the angle theta is less than the critical angle remember these sentences the angle theta is less than the critical angle c the light is traveling inside the water so here you see i have here you can see that that question number 28 the the light was traveling in the water and the water is a dense medium and the angle here is less than the critical angle so the when the light will come out it will be bended away from the normal when the light will enter from a dense medium like water into a rare medium like air the light will bend away from the normal so you can see clearly that the by a naked uh, eye inspection we are able to deduce that the r angle or the angle of refraction will be greater than the angle of incidence so let me check the marking scheme he says uh, it travels back into the water with an angle of reflection was to see no the process of total internal reflection cannot take place because the value of the angle of incidence is less than the critical angle it travels back into the water with an angle of reflection greater than c that's wrong it travels into air with an angle of refraction greater than theta yes this is the answer it travels into the air with an angle of refraction smaller than theta that's wrong so clearly the c is the right answer the angle formed will be greater than the angle of incidence i hope that you have understood question number 28 it's a bit uh, it is the actual basically a parallel beam of light is incident on a thin converging lens a parallel beam of light is incident on a thin converging lens f is one focal point of the lens which ray diagram shows the light after it passes through the lens the light rays which he has shown they are not parallel to the principal axis normally the light rays which you have studied in your textbook they are normally parallel to the principal axis but the two rows in this the, the two light beams or two light rows rays sorry uh, they are not parallel to the principal axis so let's see what happens so he has given us uh, four figures here and his question is f is one focal point of the lens which ray diagram shows the light after it has passed through the lens so after passing the one which will pass through the optical center will go undeviated and the other one will be joining that line at the plane which is passing through f so i think i think question number 29 i think c is the best option the one light ray which was passing through the optical center 
it will go undeviated and the one which pass through the upper end of the lens that should focus on the plane which is passing through the app so i think c is the best option okay the other this one a and d cannot be the answer the reason is the light ray which passes through the optical center it is not supposed to bend so a and d is straightforward wrong b the light ray which is coming and after passing through the lens is passing through f principal focus that is not right because the light should have been parallel to the principal axis and after passing through the lens then it will pass through f but not this ray so i think c is the best option sir so we have here question number question number 30 is on your screen which description of a sound wave is correct a longitudinal electromagnetic wave yes sound is no 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 sound is a longitudinal wave but it's not electromagnetic a transverse electromagnetic wave sound is not electromagnetic so a and b cannot be the answer and oscillation of particles parallel to the direction of the travel of the wave energy that is the definition of the sound d is an oscillation of particles perpendicular to the direction of the travel of the wave energy that is wrong the in the sound the particles vibrate parallel to the direction of the wave so c is the right answer question number 30 c is the right answer where does sound travel the fastest where does the sound travel the fastest so it's a fact that the sound will travel fastest in solids in solids the speed of the sound will be fastest a bar magnet is placed in a hollow iron cylinder the diagram shows the magnetic field pattern produced what is the cause of the field inside the cylinder wall so you see when you have put this uh, uh, bar magnet in this hollow cylinder so here we have the north of the bar magnet so from here the magnetic lines are coming out so they will make south here and from here the magnetic lines will go and from here a north will be produced and the magnetic lines will come back what is the cause of the field inside the cylinder wall this is electromagnetic generation no electromagnetic induction no electrostatic induction no magnetic induction yes d is the answer and what is electromagnetic induction electromagnetic induction is basically when you bring a, a electro uh, when you bring a magnetic material near a bar magnet the magnetic on the magnetic material north and south poles are generated and that magnetic material also will start behaving like a magnet in the vicinity of a bar magnet this is called magnetic induction So D is the answer. Let me check the answer. Yeah. A polythene rod is brought near to a stream of water from a metal tap, which is earthed. tap water is an electrical conductor 
the water moves towards the rod as shown. What description of the rod and water is correct? You see, the polythene rod is attracting and the water. And the only reason why this is possible, if the polythene rod is charged and the water is also charged, this can happen only if the polythene rod is charged and the water is also charged. Then they will attract each other. So I think I think A is the option that the rod is charged and the water is also charged. Question number 34. A small negative charge is placed in a point where an electric field is vertically upward. There is a force on the charge due to the field. You see, you have a small negative charge. When you have a small negative charge and you place it in the electric field and the electric field is in the upward direction, the negative charge always moves opposite to the direction of the electric field. If the electric field is in the upward direction the, and, the, and the negative charge will move opposite to the direction of the electric field. So it means that the negative charge will move downward. So in which direction does it act? Vertically downward. That's right. This is the answer. 34 and vertically. Sorry, sorry. I said upward. Vertically downward. B is the answer. Because the electric field is in the upward direction, when you put a negative charge here, the negative charge always moves opposite to the direction of the electric field. So the, electric field, the, the positive negative charge will go down. So for question number 34, uh, B is the right answer, sir. In the circuit shown, the resistance of resistor Y is four times greater than the resistance of the resistor X. What is the difference Vy minus Vx of the voltages shown on the voltmeter? So the resistance of X, for example, if it is, for example, if it is R, the resistance of Y is four times. It says the resistor Y is four times greater than the resistance of X. So if the resistance of the X, I suppose, is R, the resistance of the Y will be 4R. And then I can find out what is the voltage drop here and what is the voltage drop here. I've done this on a paper. Let me show you my work. Okay. So here we go. And you can see that... Uh, the resistance is R on the X and the resistance on the Y is 4R. So if you want to find out what is the Vx, what is the V out here? So that will be Rx divided by Rx plus Ry multiply voltage of the battery. The voltage of battery is 10. Rx is R and Rx is R and the Ry is 4 times. So 4R. So R by 5R multiplied 10, this 5 and 10 will be multiplied with each other. 2 R and R will be gone, so 2 volt. So the Vx will be taking 2 volt. So this voltmeter will be showing 2 volt. So if from the battery 10 volt is coming, 2 volts are used here. So the Y will use 8 volt. So Y will use 8 volt. You see, this Vx is 2 volt. And Vy is 8 volt. So what is the difference between them? 8 minus 2, 6 volt. So the difference between both the voltmeter readings will be 6 volt. The difference between both the readings will be 6 volt. So I think C is the best option, sir. Question number 35, C is the best option. Okay, two identical resistors connected in parallel have a total resistance of 4 ohm. 
what is the total resistance when the same two resistors are connected in series so first they were connected in parallel and their combined resistance was 4 ohm then he says if i combine those two vectors in series what will be the total resistance let me show you my paper work i have done this on a paper and let me show how i have done so when they are parallel to each other and they both are identical so i can find the r equivalent 1 by r equivalent is equals to 1 by r plus 1 by r so 1 1 by r equivalent is already given to us 4 and equals to 1 by r plus 1 by r it should be 2 by r so you cross multiply so r will be 8 so each individual resistor is of 8 ohm so his basic question is when i connect them in series with each other what will be the combined resistance or equivalent resistance when you connect the resistors in series with each other their resistances are added up so r equivalent will be r plus r and it will be 8 plus 8 at 16 ohm a very conceptual and tricky question so the r equivalent of when the two resistors are connected in series with each other will be 16 ohm it will be 16 ohm i hope you have understood and 16 ohm let's check the answers yeah you have the d option here question number uh a d 16 ohm is the answer question number 36 d is the right answer yes it's the right answer sir okay three identical lamps are 3 and 3 ammeters are connected as shown you can see here this ammeter i1 will be measuring how much current is coming from the battery here we have made two branches in the upper branch we have only single uh, lamp and in the lower branch we have two lamps so these two lamps connected in series with, with each other so their resistance will be high and here the resistance will be lower as compared to these two lamps the reading on the ammeters are i1 and i2 and i3 how are the readings related you see the current coming from the battery splits at this point some current flows through this branch and some current flows to the other branch because in this second branch with the resistance is higher that's why the i3 value will be less in this first branch the resistance is low so that's why the current will be greater and i1 will be equals to the i2 plus i3 so it means i1 will be greater than the i2 and i2 will be greater than the i3 so this is the relationship between them if you have studied electricity and electronics carefully then you will be easily able to understand so i think that d is the option sir yeah d is the option. question number 37 d is the right option a thermistor and a light dependent resistor ldr are connected in series a potential difference of 6 volt is applied across them as shown so here we have a thermistor and ldr the thermistor has a resistance of 6000 ohm in a cold room and 1000 ohm in a warm room the ldr has a resistance of 2000 ohm in dim light and 500 ohm in bright light when the potential difference across the ldr equals 2 volt the voltage across ldr is 2 volt so what are the conditions that's the question let me show you my paper work i have done this on a paper so the the voltage uh, about the, the uh, around the ldr is 2 volt and the voltage about the thermistor will be obviously the from the battery 6 volts are coming so if the 2 volts are taken by the ldr the thermistor will have 4 volts so the voltage drop uh, so the voltage drop will be uh, 4 volt uh, uh, i mean about the thermistor and 
the voltage drop across the LDR will be 2 volts. The voltage drop also depends upon the resistance. So if the thermistor will have 4 ohm, uh, so 4 volt uh, voltage drop, and the LDR will have only 2 volt, so it means that the resistance will be also double. The thermistor resistance will be double of the resistance of the LDR. So from the given values of the resistances, I have to choose an LDR resistance whose double is present in the given resistances of the thermistor. So if I choose the resistance of the LDR as 500, the resistance of the thermistor double of that 500 should be present. So that's 1000 is given. And from the given data, you can study that when the LDR resistance is 500, it is bright light. And when the resistance of the thermistor is 1000, it is warm room. So the conditions should be bright light and warm room. Bright light and warm room. Bright light and warm room. Let me go back. Bright light and warm room. So I think C is the option. Question number 38, C is the right answer, sir. It's a very, diff uh, you can see tricky question. Lot of logic is involved in this. But I can hope that you have understood it. Because the voltage drop across the thermistor is 4 volt. And the voltage drop across the LDR is 2 volt. It means that the resistance of the thermistor should be double the resistance of the LDR. If I take the resistance of the LDR as 500, the resistance of the thermistor should be double. So that can be 1000. So it means the warm room and bright light. So C is the right option. It's a little tricky and very logical. So I have to use logic to get to that answer. Question number 38, C is the right option. Okay, the next question on your screen is question number 39. A student calculates the amount of energy used by an electric heater. What is the equation for calculating the energy in kilowatt hour? You see, the formula for the electric energy is IVT. IVT. The I should be in amperes. The voltage should be in volt. And time should be in hours. Because if you want kilowatt hour, the time must be in hours. And you divide it with 1000. Why I divide with 1000? Because I want not answer in watt hours, I want kilowatts. So IV will give you the power, but when I will divide it with 1000, it will, will, it will be converted into kilowatts. So the right formula is I in amperes, multiply with the volt in volts, and time in hours, and divided by 1000. So this is how you will find, be able to find out the energy in kilowatt hours. This is how you will be able to find out the energy in kilowatt hours IVT divided by 1000 and T in hours. The next question is question number 40. An isotope P is radioactive and has a half life of seven years. A sample initially contains 0.016 kg of P. After how long will the sample contains only 0 0.0020 kg of the P? So I've drawn a grid on my paperwork. Let me show you. Let me show you. Last part. So 0 0.06, after one half life, it will become 0 0.08. Another half life pass, 0 0.04. And another half life pass, it will become 0 
So from 0 0.016, it takes three half-lives. Each half-life is seven years. So three multiply seven, it gives you 21 years. So by uh, this, let me check 21. So C is the option. Let me check. Question number 40, C is the right option. So I hope you have understood this grid. So my dear students, uh, we have reached the, we have completed this paper. So you see today we have done October, November 2021 one paper. I have tried my best to explain this paper. This paper was, its number is 11. One, one, and this is from zone one MCQ paper, we call it paper one. So I hope that you have understood these concepts. And if this video is helpful to you, if this video is helpful to you, if this video has improved your concepts, if this video is helping you and is making your study of physics easier and you are able to sit in your home and by watching the YouTube video, you are able to solve the paper, kindly like this video. Kindly subscribe my YouTube channel and kindly suggest other your, uh, your, your friends about this channel. So my channel can grow. So um, everybody, um, I will say uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for watching this video. And uh, kindly like this video and subscribe my channel. So once again, thank you very much and have a good day. And God bless you all. Have a good day.